Right, with that said, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kelly Kilpatrick from the University of Glasgow. She's an honorary research associate in the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic Studies at the University of Cambridge. She's also a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and vice president of the Pictish Art Society. Her current research projects in, uh, focus on Latin al alphabet epigraphy in Pictland, uh, the iconography of pre-Christian Pictish religion and mythology, and also the use of satellite technology and archaeology. Tonight, though, she's going to be talking to us about the Pictish nature of the carvings and inscriptions on the Newton Stone located in Aberdeenshire here in Scotland. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Kelly and she's going to share her screen with us. Oh, thank you very much. Can everyone see the screen? So, should be fine. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Tonight, I want to share with you my research about an unusual inscribed Pictish stone from Aberdeenshire, the Newton Stone, which was a very popular monument in the 19th and early 20th century, but whose importance has fallen by the wayside in recent years. Now, after careful and extensive analysis of the monument, comparison with related evidence and consultations with notable Celtic scholars, I hope to show the immense significance of this stone, which sheds light on the history of writing and conveying information on public monuments in Picklin. The Picts lived in what is now uh, Eastern and Northern uh, Scotland, north of the River Forth, including the Northern Isles and at least parts of Western Scotland, between the Iron Age and the early medieval period. The Picts were a powerhouse in Northern Britain for much of the first millennium, but ceased to be recorded in written records from the 9th and 10th centuries. And this was during the rise of the Gallic speaking kingdom of Olipa. Because the Picts and their culture went out of existence, they are very enigmatic. The Pictish language is lost, and most evidence for it suggests um, that it was a Britonic language. Now, apart from regnal lists, there are no known surviving manuscripts or texts from Pictland. We have no early Pictish ecclesiastical, uh, administrative, or literary text, and thus studying the Picts is somewhat challenging. But the pigs have, however, left behind some of the most exquisite but enigmatic sculpture works of the first millennium, and they are well known today for their symbol system, even though we do not understand what they mean. Some think it is a form of written language. I'm somewhat skeptical about this idea, but I do believe that the symbols were a system for conveying information, perhaps about individuals or multiple people. And there are about 350 artifacts uh, with Pictish symbols, the majority of which are on carved stones. Stone monuments of the Pictish period are traditionally classified into three groups. The first group is class one, and these are the earliest examples, which refer to, and class one refers to symbols carved in incision on undressed stones. These are some examples. Class two denotes relief carved cross slabs that also have Pictish symbols. And class three are monuments carved in relief without Pictish symbols. Now there are some serious flaws in this classification system, but nonetheless, it has persisted. Now moving to Aberdeenshire, in the grounds of Newton House near Inch is a Pictish symbol stone uh, and a Pictish symbol stone with two inscriptions, the latter of which is commonly known as the Newton stone. So henceforth, when I say Newton stone, I'm referring to the stone with the inscriptions, and to avoid confusion, I will call the other one the serpent stone. Both stones are irregular shaped pillars of blue gneiss, which is a type of metamorphic rock, and one that's very difficult to carve. Both stones are about two meters high, and they are reused prehistoric megaliths. The evidence suggests that they were water-worn before carving, and the Newton stone also bears prehistoric rock art. 
Across the widest part of the serpent stone are two incised Pictish symbols, a notched double disc above a serpent and Zed rod. Now the notched double disc symbol is not particularly common. And in most examples of the serpent and Zed rod symbol, the serpent faces to the right, but the one at the Newton house faces left. The serpent and Zed rod has many aspects in common with the serpent and Zed rod symbol uh, from uh, Dunrobin in Sutherland, notably the terminals on the ends of the Zed rod that goes over the serpent, which are almost opposing mirror images of one another. The Dunrobin stone is associated with the burial, which has been radiocarbon dated from between AD 575 and 625, and the similarity in style may suggest that the serpent stone belongs to the same period. The Newton stone has four carvings. The well-known carvings are the six-line alphabetic inscription across the face of the stone and the oum inscription that runs along the edge and up on the front face. After recent cleaning, a spiral was observed near the base at the back, and this is the prehistoric rock art I mentioned earlier, and a Pictish mirror symbol was also found on a flat facet near the base. Both the Newton stone and the serpent stone were carved by the technique called pocking and smoothing, and this is typical of class one Pictish symbol stones. Previously, class one symbol stones were dated to the seventh and eighth centuries, but it has long been thought by scholars in the field that class one stones are probably earlier, which is now being borne out by new archeological research and dating by Gordon Noble and others, which suggests that the Pictish symbol system may have developed as early as the third and fourth centuries AD. And I personally would argue that it probably began a bit earlier, going back into the iron age. The carvings on the Newton stone were first recognized by shepherd boys around the year 1803, and it quickly rose to fame because its discovery roughly coincides with that of the Rosetta stone uh, from Egypt, which was discovered in 1799. George Hamilton Gordon, uh, who was also Lord Aberdeen and prime minister, visited the stone in 1804 and later recounted that it was in a fir plantation near Pitmaki Turnpike. And similarly, in uh, 1814, John Pinkerton records that the two stones were discovered together in a small thicket near Pitmaki. If you can see on this map, this is where the Newton stones are located today. They were not always there. Um, they have been moved. And there is confusion in the early accounts about the association between the Newton stone and the serpent stone because they were moved from their original location at different times. The serpent stone was moved before 1760 to act as a march stone between the Rothney and Newton estates, and it was subsequently moved to the lawn of Newton House in 1794. The inscribed stone was moved to Newton House in 1837, and in 1873, both stones were moved to their present location in the east grounds of Newton House. James Carnegie, who was the ninth Earl of South Esk, uh, wrote in 1883 that the Newton stone originally stood in a plantation near Shevik Tolbar um, on the slope of a hill above the Shevik Burn. The serpent stone originally stood beside the Newton stone. This has never been doubted in the district, though written evidence of the fact is wanting. All early references uh, to the original location of the stones point to the slopes of the hill west of Pitmachi above the River Shevik. And this is the, probably the original location, this red mark here on the map. In 1835, John Stewart, who was secretary of the Spalding Club, visited the Newton Stone while it was still in situ or in its original place, and records that when the site was being trenched or dug, that several graves were discovered in a sandy ridge near to the stone. Now, this is a geological map, and the sandy ridge is clearly visible in, in, uh, in the geology maps. And because of this, 
we can now say with relative certainty that this was the original location of the Newton stone and the serpent stone. Knowing the original location allows us to examine the historic landscape and their original landscape falls within the wider pattern of features shared by many Pictish symbol stones in the Northeast of Scotland. Numerous symbol stones are located in elevated positions. They're associated with water courses, particularly the confluence of a lesser tributary and a main stream. And symbol stones in this region are often found near rootways and many are located near medieval parish boundaries. All of these features are found in the original landscape of the Newton and Serpent Stones. They were in an elevated position on this slope, overlooking the confluence of the rivers Shevok and the Uri. The historic routeway was along the bottom of the Uri Valley, and their original uh, position was near the apex of Kolsamen, Oin, and Rain parishes at this confluence. So in other words, they fit into the wider pattern of class one symbol stones within this region. Now, bearing in mind that these stones are reused prehistoric megaliths, it's possible that they may originally have come from a stone circle. There are numerous stone circles and standing stones in the region, as well as evidence for the reuse pre-existing monuments in the landscape by the Picts, particularly in Northeast Scotland. Now, in John Stewart's description that I just mentioned, uh, he says that during the trenching around the original location of the Newton stone, he records that graves were found, but he provides little detail other than that the graves were made in hard gravel without any appearance of flagstones at the sides. These landscape, landscape characteristics, such as the elevated position, pre-existing monuments, uh, watercourse confluences, boundaries, and routeways, are also in keeping with the landscape patterns associated with Pictish Barrow cemeteries. Now, several, this is not um, crop marks from, from uh, Pitmaki, but several potential crop marks are visible in this area in satellite imagery. If these stones were related to a burial ground in some way, they may have had a commemorative function. Now that you've had a bit of uh, introduction to the picks and the background about the Newton and the Serpent Stones, let's turn our attention to the carvings on the Newton Stone. There's no other Pictish monument like it. And because of the inscriptions, particularly the alphabetic one on the front, its study has generated a long history of wild speculations, many of which I have on your handout. And theories really start to get out of control by the 1860s uh, when Dr. William Mill from Cambridge suggested it was Phoenician. Shortly afterwards, George Moore um, suggested the script was Hebrew with Sanskrit and Buddhist influences. And Whitley Stokes noted in 1892 that the Newton inscription at that point had been read into Punic, Syriac, Greek, Latin, French, Icelandic, and various kinds of gibberish. With such a controversial background, it's not surprising that in 1935, Professor Robert McAllister thought it was a forgery. And since, modern, and since then, modern scholars have been somewhat hesitant to approach the monument. The general scholarly consensus is that this inscription is in an alphabet using uh, what's what most refer to as debased Roman characters. Um, so what we'll do now is putting these far-fetched notions aside, um, my aim with this research was to take a fresh look at the carvings on the Newton stone. So what do we know about it? Since the stone was a prehistoric megalith, it is likely that the pigs who carved it did not have to quarry, shape, or move the stone into position. This suggests that the carvers and perhaps the designers, commissioners, and others involved came to the stone itself. In addition to their tools, we can also discern that the carvers brought with them paint, a brush, and probably an exemplum or a template of the alphabetic inscription. Now you might be wondering, how do I know this? Examination of the carving of the letters 
in the alphabetic script demonstrates that an artisan, perhaps the same person as the carver, painted the text onto the stone first, then used the paint as a guide for carving. The letters are thicker in places where paint applied by a brush would naturally pool, and the carver conscientiously followed the paint as a guide, coincidentally preserving evidence that the text was painted onto the stone before it was carved. Now, the white paint that's on this was already there. I promise I was not painting in the letters when this photo was taken. So this is a bit of a spoiler alert. I will tell you now that the alphabetic script is in the Roman uh, or Latin alphabet. So they are in Roman characters. And comparison of the script indicates that the letters reflect forms made by a dry point stylus on media such as wax or wooden tablets. And this indicates that a person involved in the making of this monument was familiar with such an alphabet and that the artist had an exemplum of the inscription with them. In other words, they had something that they were copying from. And it may have been written on something like a wax tablet. Um, and there is other evidence that, uh, suggesting that the Picts did use wax or wooden tablets. Uh, for example, the inscription on a sword shape from St. Ninian's Isle reflects a dry point script. And recently, a potential stylus head was found in the excavation of the Pictish fort at Berghead, shown here on the slide. I'm going to turn our attention now to the Oum inscription. The Oum alphabet consists of letters made by strokes cut over or against a stem line. On stone, the stem line is usually the edge of the stone, and Oum inscriptions are almost always read from the bottom upwards. The Newton Oum is unusual. It's read from the top downwards. And it's unlikely that the Oum was copied from an exemplum or pre-painted prior to carving like the alphabetic script, because if it had have been painted, then they probably would have realized the constricted nature um, at the bottom of the stone and might not have needed to add the, the carving on the stem line. This is presuming that, that it was all done at the same time. The carvers may have felt confident to cut the strokes without paint as a guide. However, we can discern that the oum was pre-planned in conjunction with the alphabetic inscription. It has never been proven whether the carvings on the Newton stone were done concurrently, or if the inscription and symbol were added at different times. There's also been speculation about the relationship between the inscriptions because the Oum inscription has 25 letters, whereas the alphabetic one has 43 or 44. If the Newton stone belonged to the same tradition as the bilingual Oum and Latin inscriptions of Wales, then one might expect to see a correspondence between words and the inscriptions. But as we shall see, there's no obvious correlation. I believe that the inscriptions and the symbol were carved at the same time. So although the letters of the alphabetic inscription are neatly spaced in six lines, the layout is uneven. Lines one and two are not next to the oum. Lines three and four are closer to the oum. Line five is almost adjacent to the oum and carved over an uneven surface, even though they could have fitted it onto the flat space. So the alphabetic inscription gets closer and closer to the oum the further down one goes. It was observed during a um, pandemic Zoom meeting uh, with Celtic scholars that line one of the alphabetic inscription begins at the same height on the stone as does the first letter of the oum. But what separates the two is the damaged section of the stone, this bit right here. There's no evidence that there was ever carving in this section, and the fact that the alphabetic letters avoid it indicates that it was present when the carvings were made. This suggests that the viewer was supposed to begin reading the inscriptions at the same point on the monument. And the first letter of the oum at the top and the first line of the alphabetic inscription, which is why the oum is read from the top, so they're on the exact same starting point, because if the oum had started from the bottom, it would have been impossible to place uh, the alphabetic inscription. It would have to be upside down. So this is why the oum is read from the top down. 
And this also tells us that the alphabetic inscription is read from left to right. So the layout of the alphabetic inscription suggests that the carver tried to align it with the oum as much as possible while avoiding the damaged section of the stone. Therefore, the inscriptions must have been planned and carved at the same time. Now, what do they say? This is the hard part. The oum follows a natural ridge on the left side of the stone, and at the bottom, a stem line has been added in. The first word is quite clear, um, it's Itharn. So Itharn or Ethern is either the Pictish personal name Ethernon, or the Pictish equivalent of the Britonic personal name Edern, uh, without the A in suffix. If this name was supposed to be the Pictish name Ethernon, then the carvers missed one stroke for an A or two strokes for an O in the suffix. The name Ethernon is attested on three other Pictish inscriptions and is the same name recorded in the Irish Chronicles in an obit of 669, which likely refers to the Pictish Saint Ethernon, who was venerated in parts of Eastern Scotland. Now, both the Pictish name and the Britonic name are likely derived from the Latin personal name Eternus, uh, meaning eternal. And in Britonic, Latin Eternus became Middle Welsh Edern through regular sound changes. So the first name is not too problematic. The second one, or at least the second word, while the next nine letters are clear, it's considerably more complicated. It might be uh, foreign, foreigni, or perhaps foreignique. The VOR uh, prefix is derived from the Proto-Celtic preposition, um, ufer, and when used in a personal name, this has the meaning super or over, such as in the name Vortigern. So this suggests that we're probably dealing with a personal name. Now, where it becomes unclear is where the name ends. We have down here the double N. And the double N is not necessarily indicative of word termination, as the internal uh, double R of this name and the previous, are, you know, the R's are also doubled. There is almost no space between the second N and the I, and the inscription itself becomes much more constricted at this point. If the following I belonged with the foreign, then it might be a singular masculine genitive ending. So that's the case showing ownership, which reflects, might reflect conventional oomorphology as names are almost always recorded in the genitive case. But evidence for Pictish uh, language is very scarce. Another possibility is that this character here at the bottom, uh, the X forfeit character, is, um, is part of this name. It's an additional letter in the Oum alphabet that's also found on several other Pictish Oums. It originally had the phonetic value of a K or a K, as in Loch, but it developed into a long E uh, in primitive Irish, so an A sound. And on the Newton stone, it's either, this character is either intervocalic, that means it's between vowels, or it's in word final position, which suggests it would be a consonant. As this uh, X forfeit character follows the vowel, it might be an early Celtic suffix, eco or eka. So the masculine form, uh, developed into Britonic eeg, uh, and feminine eka became egg and ech in Old Irish. Now, if this is the case, this um, these two letters on the O may be the masculine form, but I would advise some caution with assuming that, because the I in the first name, Itharn, might have the phonetic value of an E, as in um, the other Pictish spellings of the name with, uh, with an E is an ethernon. And if the I here had the same value, then we might have a feminine suffix. There, in Oum inscriptions, there's a common formula which is called X Mac Y, or X the son of Y. And the Newton Oum lacks this formula. And because of this, I think it's probably unwise to necessarily immediately speculate a father-son relationship between the names. In theory, it could be a woman's name, but we have less than five attested Pictish female names, and therefore we have next to no evidence for comparison. Now, the remainder of the Oum inscription is especially difficult. 
based on examination of the stone itself, the 19th century cast, which is now in the National Museums of Scotland, high quality photographs and John Borland's drawings. Uh, this is my reading here at the top. Continuing along the edge, while normally strokes to, so OM uh, letters are organized into groups. While normally strokes to the left of the stem line would place the characters in the H group, this inscription is to be read from the top downwards. So it's kind of like a, a mirror. You have to flip the, you have to flip the letters. So therefore the letter belongs to the B group. The first three letters on the added stem line are the same as the faint letters on the uh, bottom edge. So this suggests that the carver may have realized that they would run out of space for the 10 strokes needed to carve the double R and added the stem line in the middle of the first letter of the sequence. Now the remaining letters um, on the OM inscription are a bit of a mystery. Final double R is also found on the Golsby, Aquaholi, and Verse OM inscriptions. And it might be a passive verbal ending in R which is comparable with other Celtic language languages. Uh, but we know nothing about Pictish verbal morphology. Now that's just a bit about the OM. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the alphabetic inscription. And with the knowledge that the carvings on the stone belong to the Pictish class one period, and that they reflect a script using a stylus, my approach was to compare each of these letters with early examples of dry point scripts. And I've got some examples of these in the chart on your handout. The inscription, as I told you the spoiler alert earlier, it is written in the Roman or Latin alphabet, though the language is, as far as I can tell, not Latin. I have compared the letters with a range of early scripts focusing on dry point or engraved examples, uh, including scripts by the names Old Roman Cursive, which is a majuscule or capital script uh, that was in use roughly from the first century BC to about the third century AD, and New Roman Cursive, which is a mix of capital and lowercase letters, and is evidenced mainly between the third and the seventh centuries AD. Uh, the letters on the Newton uh, inscription were also compared with unseal, and this is a majuscule or capital book hand that was in use from the 4th to the 8th centuries AD, compared it with half unseal, which is a generally minuscule or lowercase script that was in use from the 3rd to the 8th centuries. And I also compared this with insular scripts, primarily insular minuscule, which began around the 5th century. Now, the insular scripts are the ones used in early medieval Irish and Anglo-Saxon text. So what I'll do now is I'll talk you through some of these comparisons, and you can, you can look at some of these on your chart as well. In the alphabetic script, some of the letters are recognizable. That's fortunate. Letters two and three are both a T, the style of which is chronologically widespread. Letters 15, 17, 19, 36, and 38 are enclosed O's. Letters 29 and 34 are the letter I, and 27A may belong with this group as well. Letters 6, 18, and 22, not shown on this slide, are a U or a V. These were interchangeable, um, though whether or not these letters uh, had a vocalic um, or vowel or consonantal value is uncertain. Letters one, four, and five, so the ones right at the very beginning, have proved difficult to interpret. It is likely an E. If we were to compare the ductus, so you see down here at the bottom, the, the ductus is the number, sequence, and directions of the strokes used to make a letter. So if we were to compare this with other dry point examples, we can see that the Newton uh, ductus letters are made of four strokes. Whereas the examples of F uh, and most early examples of E are straight. So this, this rules out the letter F. So while no exact parallels have been found to demonstrate that this letter is an E, if it were an E, it's possible to generate a sensible reading. 
And it's perhaps intended to be a geometric or ornamental form, perhaps even a capital. And we also have to bear in mind that this type of stone is particularly difficult to carve. Letter seven is a minuscule or lowercase r. Letter nine is most likely an R, and 23 and 31 may belong with this letter group as well. An R, which is distinguished by a transverse arm, uh, that is sort of this bit, uh, sloping down and then going upwards with a dip, is characteristic of old and new Roman cursive, half unseal and insular minuscule. Other problematic letters. So letters eight, 11, 14, and 39 are tricky. But one thing that we have to bear in mind is that frequently reoccurring letters are probably vowels. These letters resemble an old Roman cursive E to some extent. The ductus of the letters in this group, however, are dissimilar to most Roman cursive E examples, which have a straight, uh, not broken um, ascender with a line down here going. Uh, it has been suggested to me that one of the only letters it could be is a Y. Y was not a native letter in the Latin alphabet, but borrowed from Greek, uh, where the earlier pronunciation was sort of like a U uh, and later an I. E. And while the ductus of 8 and 39 does not match those of an E, or really a Y for that matter, if the letter had the value of an I or an E, or something in between, it's possible to detect words in this inscription. It could be something where it's a minuscule version of the um, potential capital that we saw in letter one. Now, letters 10 and 13 are absolutely crucial for demonstrating that this is a dry point script in the Latin alphabet. Letter 10 was previously interpreted as two distinct characters, but this is in fact a disjointed M, a type found in Roman and late antique informal scripts, particularly on media engraved in dry point, such as wax tablets and ceramics. Letter 13 was also interpreted as two distinct letters, but this is in fact a G, the type of which is widely attested in Roman and late antique informal writing including wax tablet scripts and early lead inscriptions. And there's also an epigraphic example of this type of G from San Madog in Wales, which is dated to the first half of the sixth century. Now this style of G is not characteristic of insular half unseal or insular minuscule. Letter 12 is difficult. There's some similarity with wax tablet and curse P and Q, and although letter 12 doesn't quite match any P's or Q's, if it were, the reading might become intelligible. But P and Q is the closest parallels in other scripts to this letter. Letter 16 might be the same as 35. The curved arch is closer to new Roman cursive and half unseal in. But the ductus, however, again, with the Newton example, is made of two strokes, not one. And the more I look at the Newton inscription, I believe that the broken ductus is just a stylistic feature of the letters on the Newton script. While that might be a stylistic feature, it does make it difficult in some cases to reconcile some of the Newton letters with comparative examples. But again, if this letter were read as an N, a reading emerges. Now, beginning with letter 21, we start to encounter more obscure letter forms. Letter 21 resembles Greek theta, and if the Newton stone were set in a classical context, the symbol might stand for the theta nigrum, a symbol for dead attested in Roman epigraphic inscriptions and papyri. And there is also a theta nigrum found on an early fifth century lead coffin uh, from Fridgeir in Anglesey. And in some Gaulish inscriptions, a circle with a line through the center stood for a Q. Letters 23, 25, 31, 40, and 43 are problematic. They are similar to examples of cursive and half unseal S and P, but they lack ascenders and the bows on some of these descend considerably further on the right. Now, one thing that is noticeable in this inscription is that there is a conspicuous lack of the letter A. 
And I do strongly suspect that some of these reoccurring letters, potentially the ones in this group, might be A's. The one character that's attracted the most attention is the swastika-like character, uh, roughly in the center of the inscription. It's unlikely to be an X, because you can see here the approach and exit strokes of this letter don't quite match an X. It's possible that it notes a change in the text, as sometimes these features were used as punctuations in inscriptions. For example, uh, the Shanfion Fell Stone in Wales has a cross dividing the inscription between the personal names and the first part of the inscription from the remainder. Letter 26, again, is unique. It has this horizontal line beneath it, which has clearly been carved, not a natural feature. It's perhaps what you might call a conjoined letter. And if we were to remove the underline, uh, we would have a letter similar to one, four, and five, albeit it's got a straight ductus. Um, so the line between it, it might be what's called um, an epigraphic ligature, but if this is, it's not attested anywhere else. And the letters in line five are also problematic. And similarly with line six, with the inception of, with the exception of the O's, all the letters in line six are still uncertain. Based on this paleographic analysis, this is my tentative reading of the inscription with less certain letters in brackets and certain letters in capitals. Apart from the unique letter forms, these all have parallels with the Latin alphabet and with one or two exceptions, none of the letters are connected, hence the script is set rather than cursive. Now, I realize that this is not a particularly clear reading. There's lots of brackets, lots of questionable letters, but one approach would be to render this inscription in as much as is possible into one of the scripts that I've been comparing it with. Now, most letters appear to be lowercase, um, and there are some that might be capital. So as noted earlier, the letter G is not characteristic of half uncial or insular minuscule. So this suggests that we need to focus on the earlier scripts. And of the earlier scripts, the one that the Newton inscription most closely resembles is the script commonly referred to as New Roman Cursive. This is the inscription, this is the script that the Newton inscription has the most similarities with. Uh, so please bear in mind that this is ongoing research still in its early stages. But if we were to compare the Newton script with these letter forms in new Roman cursive, uh, such as this example here from Gaulish inscriptions, at least parts of the inscription are clarified. So the most likely interpretation of line one is ette. This sequence and similar variants are found on five Pictish oems, at the beginning of the inscription, and on the Drosten stone, uh, here is et. And it's highly likely that this, these letters uh, represent the same word or phrase, uh, which John Cook suggests might be a Pictish um, copula or pronoun construction, uh, meaning something like this is. And also from the point, uh, you know, from a contextual point, uh, an interpretation like this makes sense. This is potentially here is. The possible reading of the second line is, um, it's either pronounced Yurvermek or Yurvermep. Don't, don't quote me on pronunciations. And this may be two or more words, the last three letters, M-E-Q or M-E-P, possibly being a patronymic. If the final word is a patronymic, meaning son of or sons of, then what is the first part? Is it one or two words? Could this be an otherwise unattested personal name? While not impossible that it's a personal name, the form is unlike all other Pictish personal names. And it's difficult to tell if the second letter V or U is a consonant or a vowel. If it is a vowel, then EU, is, is it a diphthong? And while this resembles the Indo-European EU diphthong, this particular sound had merged into a long O in all other Britonic languages by the first century AD. So it's presumably not this. So this, this word still needs a bit of work.
However, the final three letters on line two that wrap around the side of the stone could be a patronymic comparable with Gaulish mapo, Welsh mab, or plural meb, mebion, and Irish mac, meaning sun. If this is the intended word, it's difficult to tell if it's singular plural, and to complicate matters, we find forms uh, with an E as in mech and with an A, mac, in other Pictish Oum inscriptions. The reading of the first word on line three is geon, or G-E-O-N, and this is practically identical to a name recorded in the life of St. Columba, written about AD 700. In the life, an old man named Art Brannan, uh, who was presumably a Pict as he needed an interpreter, came to visit St. Columba on the Isle of Skye, and he was said to be a leader of the cohort of Geon which was suggested by uh, Professor Richard Sharp to be equated with the Pictish territorial name K, which is where the Newton stone is located. David Dunfill, however, concluded that Gaon is likely to be a personal name. And it's also worth noting that the Irish chronicles record the death of the grandsons of Geno, which may be a version of this name, in 588. So it's possibly the same name. Now, if Gaon is a personal name, uh, which may seem more likely if it follows the patronymic, then could the first two and a bit lines read something like, this is or here is uh, Yura, the son of Geon? This is very speculative, I realize at this stage, but it does feel like we're on or near the right track. So the remainder of the inscription is still obscure though it should be noted that one possible reading of the final part of line four is Beli. And this looks like an attested Britonic personal name, which is also seen as the name of the father of the Pictish king, Brithy MacBilly, who won the Battle of Dunnekin in 685. His father was probably a king of Drath Clyde. So although a translation feels close, but just still out of reach, we can draw some conclusions about these inscriptions. The majority of the words in the inscriptions are attested, or the discernible words are attested or have close parallels in other Pictish Oum inscriptions or written accounts referring to the Picts. So this suggests that the language of the inscription is Pictish. Apart from the unique letter forms, the letters in the alphabetic inscription have parallels with those in the Latin alphabet, and most appear to be minuscule or lower case. And it is a set, not a cursive inscription. Now, the arrangement of the inscription also required its audience to have special knowledge in how to read the inscriptions. They had to recognize that the Oum was read from the top down and the alphabetic inscription from left to right. And this also suggests that some people in Pickland had knowledge of multiple scripts. And we have to bear in mind that the Newton stone is not located in a cultural backwater. It was located near major Pictish settlements such as Benahi, uh, the Royal Center at Rhiney, and Tapo North, which is one of the largest settlements in Northern Britain. I want to remind us that we should not lose sight of the fact that there is another Pictish carving on the Newton stone, the mirror symbol. Although there was ample space to carve the mirror symbol beneath the alphabetic inscription, it was carved on a protruding flat surface near the base of the pillar. The mirror symbol was sidelined, directing the viewer's attention to the inscriptions. Pictish symbols are generally paired, such as this example on the crawl stain. And the position of the Newton stone mirror, I believe may have been determined by its function and interpretation within the Pictish symbol system. The placement of the mirror and related mirror and comb symbol on Pictish monuments allows us to make certain observations about them. The long-standing consensus is that these are a feminine symbol and associated with or thought to represent women, with good reason. On class two stones, such as the Hilton of Cadball stone, the mirror and comb symbol is adjacent to a female figure and separate from other symbols. On earlier class one monuments, the mirror and mirror and comb symbol are generally placed on the lowest register of the stone. 
and Pictish monuments with the mirror symbol usually have at least two other symbols above it. And the mirror is thought to act potentially as a qualifier for the upper symbols. The general arrangement of the mirror symbols beneath symbol pairs on Pictish class one stones is I believe reflected on the Newton stone and explains why the mirror has been carved on the lower side. The carvers of this monument followed the format of Pictish symbol stones with an upper symbol pair and a lower mirror. The placement of the mirror suggests that the oum and the Latin letter inscriptions take the place of Pictish symbols. So instead of using in Pictish symbols, the information communicated by the oum replaces one symbol and the information conveyed by the alphabetic script, a different symbol. So if this is the case, it is of immense significance and may indicate that two different scripts were used specifically to reflect two artistically distinct symbols. So the pigs who designed this monument wanted to do something to really stand out, but they were still operating within their own system of conveying information on public monuments. Newton stone may provide the key towards decoding the Pictish symbol system and thus translating the inscriptions is one of my ongoing priorities. In conclusion, this examination of the Newton stone has revealed and the serpent stone has revealed their original landscape setting and analysis of the Newton stone alphabetic scripts indicates that it was first painted on the stone prior to carving and that it reflects a set dry point Roman alphabetic script. The discernible words in the inscriptions are Pictish. Several of the letters, including some of the more obscure letter forms, have parallels with Roman cursive examples. And these are uh, particularly uh, closely associated with early scripts. So this suggests that the Newton script belongs to the late antique period. The letter forms of the alphabetic script and combined with the oum suggest that the inscription is best placed in the late sixth or early seventh century, though an earlier date should not be ruled out. So this research, including the translation of the inscriptions is ongoing and forms a larger part of, larger part of my work on early Latin letter inscriptions in Scotland. So I welcome any thoughts or comments you may have on this matter. And thank you very much for listening to the talk. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes, see if um, anybody has any questions, please write them down in the chat. Uh, yep, our colleague Chris has just mentioned that as well. So feel free to put these in the chat. Kelly is sticking around for a minute or two. Uh, Chris has said uh, it's very interesting to see pre-existing damage to the stone uh, used as a guide for the start of the inscription. He's asked, might it have been a deliberate division mark or reference mark in its own right? Uh, he comments that it also evokes material parallels to the practice of medieval scribes writing around holes in parchment, which is, yeah, very good point. So, yeah, the question there is, um, might it have been a deliberate division mark or reference mark in its own right? Uh, I, think, I, I, think, I think, Chris, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said medieval scribes writing around wormholes in parchment, um, because with the oum, they would have needed an edge to carve um, the inscription. So it seems that they have carved the oum, but in order to get the alphabetic one to align as closely as possible, they've simply had to just avoid that space. And it's not uncommon in early sculpture uh, for carvers to avoid damage on stones. This is um, this is something that you see um, in early uh, inscriptions from Wales as well. So there's a lot of parallels for that. This is again something that you see in particularly in the earlier stage when they're using undressed stones. And it's something that you don't really get by the time of the um, relief carved monuments because those are very well prepared and dressed slabs. So again, it's, it's characteristic of monuments of the earlier period. And I think they probably have tried to avoid this. And something that I have not gone into detail about is the very hard nature of this stone. Um, I have spoken with a stone carver before, and that's a type of stone that they try to avoid because it's very difficult to carve. Thank you. Um, a couple of people have uh, 
raise similar sounding questions here about um, wanting to know a bit, uh, get a bit more clarification on whether you think the writing is sort of taking place, uh, taking the place of symbols on this particular stone. Um, yeah, just wanted clarification around did the writing represent an evolution away from the language of symbols or yeah, what your thoughts are? I think it might, if, if only we had another stone like this, but we don't, we have, we have nothing for comparison. They were clearly trying to show off. They, uh, they seem to be, whoever designed this seemed to have lots of multicultural knowledge. Um, they were, they were familiar with Oum, uh, and they were familiar with the Latin alphabet. Um, and it seems as if they are, they're trying to do something different. Uh, while operating still within a system of communication that they're familiar with. They're trying to stand out. Now, whether or not it's a development away from symbols, I think it's seeing as this is the only one uh, monument like this that has survived, probably suggests that the symbols won out in the end as being the much more common um, uh, form of communication on public monuments in Pickland, because we know that the symbol system continued into um, uh, into the class two period of relief carved monuments. Whether or not it was an intention to move away from uh, representing symbols or whether or not they were just trying to do something really different. Uh, it's, I, I think it probably the former, I think they're probably trying to stand out. Um, and if we, if there were more examples like this, it might suggest they, they were moving away from symbols. Um, but something else um, I didn't go into great discussion about is the is comparisons with the bilingual uh, Latin and Oum inscriptions of Wales uh, and Southwest Britain. Those uh, that was a tradition, um, a sculptural phenomenon that was going on at the same time uh, that the Newton stone was made. So it's possible that they're trying to emulate that tradition as well. They might be aware of it, um, but they haven't quite followed all the uh, stylistic features mm. of that tradition in that it's not clear, usually in, in the bilingual inscriptions of Southwest Britain, there's some correspondence between the Oum and the Latin inscription, but not here at Newton. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, thank you for answering that. I was curious too about that <laughs> point. Um, I've also got time for a couple more questions if you're happy. Um, yeah, 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 they're, no, I have they're no flooding in now. It's <laughs> Um, so Fiona Campbell Howes has asked, um, she said, brilliant talk, thank you, um, and enjoyed the detective work. So she was very excited about the possibility of the Pictish word ete, uh, standing for here lies. Um, wanting to know, um, does the, do the other examples of ete on other stones also occur alongside burials or sort of funerary contexts? Oh, that's something I don't know about off the top of my head, to be honest. Um, I would have to look that up. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the other OM inscriptions are associated with burials. Um, no, that's something I'd have to look up. Uh, there, there's a bit of disagreement uh, in, in the linguistic field about what that particular sequence of letters means in Pictish. Um, it doesn't quite follow a lot of the linguistic rules that would make it a um, uh, copula plus, I think, pronoun um, construction. Uh, but one of the things I, when dealing with Pictish linguistics, it's very, very complicated, <laughs> uh, which is an understatement because we don't have a lot of written material or inscribed material to work with. Um, and one of the things that I try to bear in mind when looking at this is context. I think context is really important and something that linguists need to bear in mind. Um, so that's why I do think that the suggestion that it means something like this is or here is, it, it makes sense and it doesn't quite, we don't quite understand how it fits linguistically at the moment with other Britonic or Goidelic languages. Um, but I do think that when dealing with this per type of particular type of material that we have to bear context in mind. Absolutely. Um, we've got quite a few more thank yous and uh, thanks, thanks very much for speaking comments coming in. Um, just a couple more. So uh, Megaland, I think that's how you'd say that name, um, has asked um, how common it might be to see two paired stone like these Newton stones, sort of following on from your comment just then about 
context. Um, say, they've said, uh, it is interesting to see that the serpent stone has two symbols and the mirror is on the side of the Newton stone closest to the serpent stone. I suppose that might have changed though, depending on where yeah, they were I don't originally really know. found. Yeah, I don't know where they were placed, exactly where they were placed. Um, and so Megaland is asking, is there any precedent for the possibility that the mirror symbol is in dialogue with the two more conventional symbols or yeah? That's um, my conclusion is that the mirror is in dialogue in some way with the two inscriptions. Um, if I were to go back um, a couple of slides, um, this one. So this is some example. Uh, these are some examples of uh, Pictish uh, sort of class one stones that have two symbols um, with a mirror symbol placed on the lower register or the side register. Um, thank you. Yes. So. So yes, I think it is working in dialogue with them in some way. And perhaps it might be, you know, it's not impossible. Um, I, I'm quite confident that one day we will get a, a translation of this or, or so, as close as possible. Um, and that may help to explain the mirror as well. Fabulous. I suppose I had one question for you. Um, I was wondering with these uh, sort of inscriptions, is there evidence um, that more than one person was writing them. Do, is there a handwriting that you see sort of, um, or, or is it sort of, you think one person has dedicated the time to, to create these two separate scripts or do you think it was um, more than one artist at work? No, that, that is actually a really good question. And the Newton stone does feature um, in these arguments because it's not entirely certain if the um, Oum inscription that's on the added bit at the bottom, you know, the bit that comes up, if that might have been carved by um, a different person to the one who carved it on the edge. Um, so, and, and, and that's a bit uh, difficult to discern. It probably was the same person. Um, I think it, it was um, actually in an article in the 1950s where it was argued that it might be two separate people. Um, and this was based on the depth at which the letters were carved. But one of the things that um, Catherine Forsyth points out is that we might not necessarily want to jump to that conclusion because they're carving the letters deeper on the edge, but not necessarily on the face. So we can't entirely say um, that it wasn't the same person. Now, it might have been two different people who carved the Oum and the alphabetic one, or they might have been the same. Um, it's very hard to it's very hard to tell. Yeah, interesting possibility, which leads me back towards a question I saw that Brian Foster had written. And um, if you're happy, that's a, that'll be our final question, I think. Um, they've asked, is it possible that the evidence you were discussing about, um, you know, a, an author looking at a painted template and then carving, does that perhaps indicate a, a level of illiteracy um, with the person carving? Um, yeah, all your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, the, the carver doesn't necessarily have to know what they're carving, they just need to copy it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the, the carver might have been literate, they might not have been. Um, if since the evidence suggests that they were looking at something, perhaps something carved onto a wax tablet and then painted onto the stone and they copied the painting, that might suggest that they were not in the carver was not entirely familiar with um, the Latin alphabet. So someone else may have been responsible uh, for writing that. Um, so yes, I, I think it's it's and it it suggests that this was um this was a, a multiple person, you know, task. Um, quite a few people probably came together to plan this. Um, they clearly put a lot of thought into it. Um, and they were clearly trying to do something different uh, for a very special purpose. And that purpose might have been to commemorate one or more individual, um, or it might have been for another reason, but they, they were trying to do something very special. And we're just really fortunate that it has survived. Yeah, absolutely. And and for you to be able to interact with it with your own photos as well is fantastic um, that it survived to this day. So thank you so much for um, taking the time. I think we'll wrap up there. But um, before we go, is there um, any way that uh, people can best follow your research? You, do you have a Twitter account or uh, anything you'd like to sort of share? Or... Um, oh, thank you. I, I do. I have a, a website. Um, mm -hmm. which I try to update. Yeah. Um, I do have a Twitter account. Um, I'm also on uh, Facebook. Um, and 
um, yeah, the few YouTube videos and things like that. So yeah, no, please feel free to contact me. Fabulous. Well, if we can share, yeah, Chris has just shared your website in oh, the okay. chat. Oh, thank so you, there we go. I did see somebody had asked how yeah. to best follow up on your research. So um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank I've, you everyone I've for listening. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of notes taken and you're getting lots of thank yous in the comments okay. too. Oh, thanks so, very much everyone. Yeah, if we're all happy to leave it there, I just want to say thanks to everybody else for joining as well. Um, and Chris has also mentioned that seminar series will be continuing um, in April. Details will be confirmed um, via the membership email and social media channels. So we'll be in contact with you all then. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and thank you again, Kelly. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Bye.